Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. If you haven't dealt with big data, you probably ask yourself how you can ingest terabytes of data, because you probably already have terabytes, if not petabytes of data, and it's keep growing. How you can make this data available for customer-facing dashboards, because in today's world, users are, are expecting to get answers in real time. And finally, how you can do all of that in a cost-efficient manner, because every organization deeply care about the bottom line. So indeed, this is a very difficult question, and this is exactly what we are going to discuss today. We've been using Druid for the past six years uh, to solve these type of problems, and we believe that we have uh, uh, very good insights, uh, and we want to share them with you in this presentation. Before we start, just, just a short disclaimer. Um, this presentation mostly covers advanced topics in Apache Druid, but we still believe that it can be useful for broader audience, so no need to worry if you don't have previous experience. However, if you are looking for an introductory session about Apache Druid, please check out uh, our previous talk from Big Data London at 2019. And finally, this presentation mostly describes our journey with Apache Druid while me and Itai worked at Nielsen. Okay, so my name is Yakir. I'm currently co-founder and CEO at Cocoa AI. And previously, I've been leading the Nielsen Identity Group at Nielsen. I mainly focus on big data and machine learning solutions. And with me today, Itai, who is currently a principal solutions architect at Imply, and previously he was big data tech lead at Nielsen, he led our big data group technology. Uh, and as you can see, he has been dealing with big data challenges for quite some time, some time now. Okay, so what we're going to discuss today. First of all, we're going to discuss data modeling, and we're going to show you how you should efficiently uh, or correctly model your data in order to ingest it later into Druid. Then we're going to, we're going to also discuss data ingest, ingestion, and we're going to show you how to ingest terabytes and petabytes of data into Druid. Then we're going to discuss retention and deletion, because ingesting data is important, but it's also important to know when to delete data so you don't pay for uh, uh, data that you don't use. And finally, we will discuss query optimization, and we will share with you tips and tricks on how to improve uh, your queries. And finally, we will, sh we will show you how to leverage all that knowledge in your organization. Okay, so before we start, uh, a short business context. So Nielsen is a data and measurement company, which means that we collect uh, data from various sources, online and offline sources. And all the data that we collect is device level or person level data, which means that for every event, we have a device identifier or a person identifier. And the data that we collect is being used for measurement and targeting purposes. Now, the data infrastructure that supports the collection of all this information is quite extensive. So we process 10 billion events on a daily basis on our Kafka cluster. We store more than 60 terabytes per day on S3. In general, we have more than five petabytes of data in our data lake. Talking about Spark, we are uh, uh, running more than 6,000 nodes every day. And finally, when talking about Druid, we are ingesting tens of terabytes of data into Druid on a daily basis. And we are doing all of that to solve uh, various use cases. But in this presentation, I want to focus on two use cases. The first, the first one is what we call building target audiences. Audience is a composition of uh, uh, devices or persons that share some common attribute. So for example, an audience can be the set of devices uh, that are being used by females in a specific region. So what you see in this screen is basically uh, um, how we expose to users the ability to define audiences. So our users uh, 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 choose the different attributes they want uh, uh, from the bottom part of the screen, and they drag them to the upper part of the screen. And while doing that, they also define the relation between the different attributes. So as, as you can see, we have all relations, we have end relations, and we also have not relation. And what we need to do is to calculate in real time the number of unique devices or unique persons 
that exists in this audience. And we need to show the number again in real time in the blue box at the top. Okay, so this was the uh, first uh, uh, use case. The second use case is what we call uh, funnel analysis. Marketeers in general need the ability to analyze the performance of their campaigns. They also need to understand how many people reach each stage in the funnel. Essentially, what they're trying to do is to compare different funnels and understand which funnel produce the biggest number of purchases. Now, the motivation behind that is that once they find these uh, uh, funnels that works best, they want to spend more money on this funnel. Now, we need to analyze the different stages in the funnel and report the number of unique persons that reached each stage in the funnel. So this is the second use case. And as you've seen, we have diverse use cases. And we wanted to uh, um, uh, find a single system that can help us solve these different use cases. We didn't want to have a dedicated system for each use case, because then it means that uh, our infrastructure will get too complex. So Druid, because of its flexible architecture, because of the extensive query language, and also the ability to fine tune the system, was a great fit for us. Now, if you also think about it, there is um, a core challenger. Um, both of these problems, both of these use cases, uh, essentially what we are trying to do is to find the number of distinct elements. And we try to do that in real time, because again, there is a user waiting in the screen for the result. And we try to do that at scale, because as you've seen, we have very big numbers. So again, if you think about it, uh, uh, both the, for building audience and for funnel analysis, what we are trying to solve is the count distinct question. And unfortunately, if you try to solve the count distinct uh, problem and do that in real time and do that at scale, you will find out that there is no space efficient and time efficient and accurate solution. Um, so what people are usually doing is choose approximation algorithms instead. And this is exactly what we did. We chose Theta Sketch. Now, Theta Sketch, because it's an approximation algorithm, it means that you don't get the exact number of unique elements. You get some estimation, which should be good enough. But in return for the loss of accuracy, you get significant improvements, both in the time required for, for the solution and in the space required for the solution. Now, Theta Sketch is based on the idea of k minimum values, where k is a constant that defines the number of samples that you store. Remember, we are talking about approximation algorithms. You don't need to store all the elements in your universe. You store only a sample of them. And minimum values refers to the process of choosing which elements you need to store. Now, with Theta Sketch and KMV, you can estimate set cardinality, which means that you can get the number of unique elements in a set. And for us, the biggest benefit was its great support for set theoretic operations. So we could calculate the intersection between two sets or the union between two sets. And this was very important for us. Like, remember the, the, the first example that I showed you. Now, the only downside uh, as that we found with Theta Sketch was when we tried to intersect a very small set with a very big set. Only in this specific scenario, the error was relatively high. But Itai will show you uh, uh, some ideas and methods on how you can avoid this specific problem. OK, so we chose that sketch, but now we have to find a concrete implementation. And luckily for us, that sketch is supported in Druid via the great data sketches library from Yao. The way that it works is that during ingestion time, based on your configuration, the different sketches are being created and stored as Druid segments. And then at query time, the sketches are being pulled and aggregated. Now, first, there is an initial aggregation. And then based on your configuration, uh, uh, and it also depends whether you want a union or intersection, there is a post aggregation that is being performed. From a user perspective, the final result uh, uh, that you're getting is the estimated number of unique entries or unique elements that the final aggregated sketch represents. 
Now, this is a very basic explanation about Theta Sketch. If you want to learn more, I encourage you to go and watch this short video that can give you some basic intuition to how Theta Sketch works behind the scenes. All right, so we discussed the count distinct problem, and we said that Theta Sketch can help us solve this problem, and we said that Druid supports Theta Sketch. But now we have to build a full pipeline that combines everything into a single solution. And Itai will show you exactly how we did that. Thank you. Thanks, Akil. Cool. So let's go over the parts of our uh, flow and focus on each one of them and provide those tips and tricks that Akil promised. So let's start with data modeling. Here's a rather naive approach to data modeling in Druid. Uh, take this imaginary data source where you have the timestamp uh, column. You have a dimension, which is the audience name. And audience, as Akira explained, is a common characteristic for a set of devices or set of persons. And we, have, uh, we also have the device ID. Now, why is this a naive approach? Because if we want to know how many unique devices or uh, tablets, for example, for a given date, then we'll have to scan, we do kind of a table scan and find uh, the answer for that. And this will probably be uh, uh, quite a slow query. A better approach would be to leverage the Theta Sketch uh, model that you mentioned and replace the device ID with a Theta Sketch metric that represents the approximated number of unique devices that uh, fulfill some kind of criteria. So for example, if we want to know how many uh, tablets were used in a given date, we only need to, to extrapolate that number from this single sketch. However, what happens uh, if we need to uh, find out or intersect a very large set, for example, all tablets for used in a given date with a very small set, for example, Druid committers, which unfortunately for us is a very small, uh, just a handful of, of, of people. Now, as you mentioned, in this case, most likely the result will, will be uh, uh, will have a very high error rate. A way to mitigate that is to extract the device type into a different dimension. And then if we want to know how many Druid committers were using tablets in a given date, there's no intersection. We actually have only one sketch that we need to uh, use in order to extrapolate the approximated number of unique devices. Another thing is, what if we want to change an audience name? Let's say that rather than calling it football fans, we want to call it American football fans because as we all know, football and American football are not the same. So the naive approach would be to store the audience name as is, and if we need to change the value, we actually need to go through this data source and maybe re-index the data or take some uh, relative, um, similar measures in order to do so. But a better approach to be leveraging grid lookups. What are lookups? Lookups are basically uh, a mapping between some kind of an arbitrary ID, like this audience ID here, and a string like the audience name. Those mappings can be stored in files like CSVs or in tables in relational database like MySQL. And then uh, Druid will uh, load those mappings into the memory of query serving nodes in a background thread. Now, how would our fact tables look like or our data sources? Rather than store the audience name as part of the data source, we'll only store the audience ID. Now, the users that are watching or viewing the dashboards, they are not familiar with this arbitrary, arbitrary ID. So what we actually need to do is either use the uh, lookup SQL function, or if you're using newer Druid versions, you can join the data source with uh, the lookup table and actually present the real audience name to your uh, uh, customers in the dashboards. Now, lastly, if you want to change the audience name, we only need to do, is to do it in one place, which is the origin of the lookup, as I mentioned, for example, the table in the, in the relational database. So to summarize the data model section, we showed you how you can use Theta Sketch for fast and efficient count distinct, and we told you you need to pay attention to intersections. We also showed you how you can leverage lookups to handle slowly changing dimensions. Finally, we encourage you to check out the schema design page on Druid website to get more tips around that. Now, once we model the data, let's see how we can ingest it. So there are actually a few ways to ingest data into Druid. You can use the streaming or the real-time uh, ingestion uh, using Kafka or Kinesis, for example. And you can also ingest data in batch via the Hadoop-based or the native-based ingestion. So we actually chose the Hadoop-based ingestion. 
for a few reasons. First, technical considerations. So when we started off with Druid a few years ago, it was uh, far more mature than uh, all the other uh, ingestion methods. Also, it's very scalable. So if we need to ingest uh, more data for a given period, we can just uh, scale out a Hadoop cluster and handle that peak in the data. There's also the sense of business requirements. Now for us, we're analyzing daily trends. So for example, campaigns and stuff like that, like, like you mentioned. So ingesting the data in batch once a day or even a few times a day was good enough. Now, since the Adobe ingestion is still widely used among uh, large parts of the read community, I want to share two tips with you. The first one is, what if you actually want to ingest data to multiple data sources in parallel from separate Hadoop clusters. So the way to do that is using uh, the, what is called in Druid affinity. Affinity is basically a mapping between a middle manager and data source so that you can point each one of your Hadoop clusters to a specific middle manager and that will ingest the data into the specific data source it's uh, affiliated with. Now, another very important thing to understand is that when using the Hadoop based ingestion, uh, it actually runs two MapReduce jobs by default. The first one is the determined partitions, which actually scans all the data and determines based on the target roles per segment uh, config property, how many partitions or shards it will need to uh, produce. And the second is the index partitions, which actually builds those partitions or shards. Now, you can actually speed up your ingestion significantly if rather than using target roles per segment, you use num shards uh, as part of your partition spec. So this uh, completely removes the need to run the determined partition job and only run the index partitions. This is very good uh, and useful in cases where your data volume is uh, quite fixed uh, or you know in advance how many shards you want to create. So to summarize the ingestion section, we talked about the multiple options you have to ingest it into Druid. I explained why we chose the Hadoop as ingestion and I showed you how you can uh, use things like affinity or optimize your ingestion uh, with a trade-off between target rows per segment and num shards. So after we uh, modeled and ingested the data, let's see how we can control retention and deletion. So there are three terms you need to be familiar with. The first one is load rules, which uh, determines which segments will be loaded into the cluster from the deep storage based on an interval or a period of time, and also how many replicas per segment will be loaded in the cluster. The flip side of that is draw, uh, drop rules, which determine which segments, or actually when segments, should be dropped from the cluster, but still not uh, completely deleted from deep storage. And lastly, kill tasks are those tasks that permanently delete all information about the segment and remove it from deep storage. Now, the notion of uh, uh, versions uh, in uh, deep storage is a notion that's worth getting uh, to know, because when you re-index data or append data, segments and new versions for each segments are being created and those segments uh, those sorry versions actually take up space in deep storage however only the latest version is actually being used it's uh, being marked as used equals one in the metadata store now in order to uh, remove all the redundant storage or all the redundant versions what you should do is specify your the interval in your kill the task as wide as possible now, don't be afraid of doing so because it will only delete those segments that are, or versions actually, that are marked as unused, meaning used equals zero. Now, let's take a concrete example. We had a data source with one year retention period, and our deep storage was AWS S3 based. Now, we can see that uh, the kill task interval was uh, everything older than 30 days, meaning all versions are older than 30 days, uh, that, and our unused will be deleted. That took up over 350 terabytes in our S3 deep storage, and it cost us over $8,000 a month. By only changing the kill task interval to delete all unused segments other than two days, we were able to significantly reduce the storage and the cost, and we're talking about over 95% improvement. So that's uh, a huge improvement only for one data source. Another cool uh, thing that we're doing with Druid is dimension-based DTL. Now, as with any other database out there, Druid can uh, or allows you to delete data based on the timestamp. But what if uh, you want to delete data based on some kind of dimension? And let's consider this sort of GDPR use case. Let's say that you're allowed to store up to 90 days worth of data from US, but only up to 30 days worth of data from EU countries like Sweden. You can see that in this made up data source, we currently have data 
for both countries that's older than 30 days. We also want to ingest new data. So what we do is we run the Hadoop-based uh, ingestion task, and you can see that we eliminated or removed uh, the data that's older than 30 days from Sweden, only kept data that's older than 30 days from US, as uh, the regulation allows us. And we also added new data for both countries. Now, the way to achieve that is using the multi-type input spec in your Hadoop-based ingestion task, which allows you to combine other input specs. So you actually add new data from, for example, S3 with existing data from your data source. Now in the type data source uh, section, you can actually use a filter as part of your ingestion spec to filter uh, the rows that you want to remove or you want to keep. Now, this is, was a very uh, high level overview, but my colleague and I uh, actually wrote a, a deep dive blog about it. So you can check it out here to, under, to better understand how we do that. So to summarize the retention deletion, we talked about load and draw pools. We talked about kill task and why those are important to remove, to completely remove unnecessary data. And we showed you uh, how to do dimension-based DTL. So after we modeled the data, ingested it, and uh, controlled its retention and deletion, let's talk about the important part of querying it. Now, Druid supports, uh, supports two query methods, which uh, the first one is the native uh, language, which is JSON-based. And the other one is Druid SQL. Now, maybe it won't be a surprise that we chose the native uh, query language. Well, because mainly because Druid SQL didn't even exist when we started off with Druid. However, Druid SQL is rapidly expanding with each version, as you can see in this link. And for example, querying theta sketches from SQL was added way back in Druid 014. And the union all operator was recently added in Druid 020. So uh, that's why today, if you'd start with Druid, you'd probably want to start with Druid SQL. Now, Query optimization is very significant uh, for all customer uh, uh, facing uh, dashboards. So let's uh, uh, take the specific use case of tuning data sketch queries. Now, the first part is tuning data sketch size for performance. If you remember, uh, Yaku mentioned data sketch is based on KMV, and K stands for the number of samples we'll take from our incoming stream of events. So this uh, uh, size parameter, which is equivalent to the K, is how we define the uh, uh, accuracy of our queries. So queries with a, a relatively large size, uh, let's say size equals 65,000, are rather heavy on resources, thus they will take more time. You can switch to a more moderate size like uh, 4,000, and this can significantly improve the speed of your queries. And it's very useful when there are no intersections, to, so there is a relatively small effect on accuracy. On the other hand, uh, you can also tune test sketch for accuracy. This is a real uh, example from one of our data sources. You can see we're using the SQL uh, function that's called approximate count uh, distinct DS theta. And we provide the metric name that we want to approximate based on it. And you can see the result was over 3 million. Now, by adding the 65,000 size parameter uh, as a second argument to this function, you can see that we got a bit higher result, right? The difference is about, um, I think, 3,000 or something like that. And I can assure you that this uh, result is more accurate. Now, it's often overlooked, but this approximate count distinct theta function has the optional argument of size, which by default is 16,000. So you can see, you can uh, it's a trade-off. So if you choose a, a smaller size, your queries will be faster, but a bit less accurate. And if you choose a larger size, your queries will be more accurate. So to summarize the query section, we showed you uh, the two query methods that are supported. We explained why we chose the native query language, but why you should probably go with uh, the SQL language. And finally, I showed you how you can tune Tata Sketch to balance between performance and accuracy of your queries. I really want to uh, overview this uh, bonus slide because this question comes up really often in the Druid forum and other uh, uh, user groups. So how do you set up a read-only cluster? Let's say you have a production cluster and you want to have a dev cluster that's a replication of that. So to do that, you can have your read-only cluster pointing at the same deep storage as your operational cluster. You create a read and write role for the operational cluster. So that will allow you to ingest new data as well as obviously read existing data. And you create a read-only role for the read-only cluster, which will prevent you from accidentally ingesting new data. Now, the only uh, thing you, uh, in addition, you need to do is to periodically restore the metadata store from the backup 
of your operational uh, cluster metadata store into your read-only cluster metadata store. And you get a read-only cluster uh, with only a very uh, a few actions. So to summarize uh, everything we discussed, we showed you how you can just terabytes of data, make it available for customer-facing dashboards, and do all that in a cost-efficient manner using Apache Druid. So just, just before uh, I wrap things up, a few things we care about. Women in Big Data is a worldwide program that aims to inspire, connect, grow, and champion the success of women in the big data analytics field. There are over 40 chapters worldwide, and everyone can join regardless of gender. So we really encourage you to find a chapter near you using this Women in Big Data website. There are a couple of past interesting talks that we gave, including the Druid intro session from Big Data LDN 2019 that Yakir mentioned, and also uh, a recent talk we gave at uh, about fun analysis with Apache Spark and Druid at the Data and AI Summit 2021. There are also a couple of blog posts that we think will interest you, uh, and specifically those two blog posts about data retention and deletion in Apache Druid and part two about data deletion in Apache Druid. Great. We'll be taking questions now, and we really appreciate you participating and joining our sessions. If you have any questions, you can ask them now in the Q&A section. And if you have any feedback, your feedback is very valuable for us. So feel free to reach us, uh, to reach us uh, both over Twitter and LinkedIn. Thanks, everyone.